Let's go to Genesis 35. Hopefully, we'll, um, we're going to finish this entire chapter this time. Now, this map is going to be important because Jacob went through many places in this chapter. So we're going to go to step by step and see where he went to. We're going to go to Genesis 35, and then I'll start off with a word of prayer. Uh, Father, will you cleanse away our sins with your holy blood and fill within us your spirit, both the speaker and the hearers. For Heavenly Father, uh, nothing will... Uh, come out well, unless your instruments are completely yielded to thee. And I pray that you'll take the full honor and glory. Uh, Lord, we gather ourselves together today for a reason. We open our Bibles today for a reason. We write notes for a reason. Uh, we hear your word for a reason. Uh, I come here to speak your word for a reason. It's so that we can apply these things in our life, grow our knowledge, glorify you, draw closer to you. So will you help us with all of that, Heavenly Father, today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Genesis 35. And then uh, we're going to look at verse chapter 35. And we will look at verse 5. Okay. I will briefly mention verse 5. And then we'll get down to verse 6. Okay. I'll briefly mention verse 5. Then we'll get down to verse 6. So if you look at Genesis 35, 5, I explained it last time, basically. Uh, Jacob, he is finally leaving uh, Shechem. So remember, he backslid. He wasn't supposed to go here. Originally, he was supposed to go to Bethel. But because he was at Shechem, the Lord diverted his path where he was finally able to leave the place. He was worried about those Hivites where they might kill Jacob. But... The Lord, if you read that passage, God's terror was upon the land of the Hivites so that they don't pursue after Jacob. Why? Because Jacob's two boys, they were slaughtering all the inhabitants of that town. And because they were slaughtering everyone left and right there, that's why those Hivites got scared and didn't chase after them. They left them alone. So the terror of God was on that whole place and they didn't pursue after them. So verse 6, verse 5 was explained last Sunday, so I'll do now verse 6 word for word. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan. So Jacob, he came to a place called Luz, and that's in the land of Canaan itself. So all, all of this is pretty much Canaan's territory that he's at. But Luz is another word for Bethel. So you might recall if you... Uh, go back to Genesis, I think it was uh, 28, I'm not sure, but in that chapter, you might recall the place was first called Luz. But then Jacob called it Bethel, which means house of God, because the Lord met him there. It may be that portal, that entrance to God's house, as I've talked to you last time, it's possible. So he came to Bethel, which means house of God, he and all the people that were with him. So Jacob himself and all the people that uh, were with him, that followed along with him, came to Bethel. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel. So as soon as he arrived in Bethel, he called that place by its name El Bethel, as he built an altar as well. So El Bethel means uh, God, house of God. It's as if uh, Jacob, he wanted to do a double altar call or double commitment, double dedication, however way you want to call it when he came here. This was a very special place where he committed himself to the Lord, where he worshiped the Lord. The evidence was the first two verses of Genesis 35. You might see over there, he was prepping himself as if he was going to church or make a commitment to the Lord, some kind of religious dedication. So the name of it at verse 7 shows that religious confirmation dedication again, that commitment he's making to the Lord. Uh, these verses can point out right here uh, the importance of making commitments to the Lord. It's not once a year thing like a New Year's resolution. This is something that should be done occasionally. And you'll notice that Jacob, in this passage, he wasn't content with his old commitment. Verse 6 is Bethel. That's an old name. His commitment he made many years ago. He wasn't content to just leave it there. He was committed at verse 7 to make another commitment, fresh and anew, El Bethel, house, uh, God, house of God. So he makes a new commitment right here. 
So in uh, Jacob's first place that he goes to, he goes to Bethel. When Jacob travels to Bethel, we've seen from the previous verses, he makes a, a religious commitment. He makes a commitment to the Lord. In this commitment he makes to the Lord, it's not, uh, it's not an old commitment. It's uh, a new commitment again. He makes a new commitment. The evidence is by how he named it. He wasn't content to just call it Bethel. He called it El Bethel. So that means God, house of God. So God, house, God. That's the idea in Hebrew, if you look at that. <clears throat> Continuing onwards. Verse 7, the last part, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. He called it God, house of God, because that's where God appeared to Jacob a uh, long time ago when he ran away from his brother's face, Esau. All right, verse 8. But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. Uh, if you look at uh, right here as the journey continues on, in under an oak, Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried. The last part of verse 8. And the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. Alon Bakuth. Okay, let me draw it out right here. That way we can see what's going on. So, <clears throat> on the way in the journey, buries her underneath an oak tree. This oak tree, Alon Bakuth, he called it by that name because Alon Bakuth means uh, oak of weeping. Oak of weeping or the weeping oak. Continuing onwards, verse 9, And God appeared unto Jacob again <clears throat> when he came out of Padanaram and blessed him. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice God appears to Jacob again. Uh, when he left Padanaram, that's where he was with Laban, you might remember. God appears again and blesses him, even though... Chapter 35, verse 1, he appeared previously. You might say, why would God appear again? Well, God appeared again, notice, after he did his commitment. After he did his commitment, a new commitment, got something straightened out right with the Lord. Then God appears again uh, and, then and then says that I'll bless you. God will bless you every time uh, you go back to the place where you have to commit but you can't just uh, go by an old commitment, but rather make it refreshed and renewed. If you do that, then the Lord will bless your life. Amen. So that's why uh, we do have church every Sunday. I believe it is very important. Why? Because we have to renew our commitments, refresh it. We have to go to Bethel again. Verse 10 through 12 will even explain even more so. And God said unto him, so God speaks to Jacob, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. So God says, your name is Jacob, but you won't be called any more Jacob. Israel will be your real name. The Bible says in verse 10, and he called his name Israel. So God called him Israel. So isn't it interesting that God says, that yeah, your name won't be any more called Jacob, but Israel. Didn't he already say that? He already said that, if you recall, back at Genesis, I think it was 32. But in this passage, God is confirming. God is confirming his promise to Jacob. And it seems like, I could be wrong, but verse 10 is when he called him Israel. So think about that. If in this passage he finally calls him Israel, then way back then when he said, you won't be called Jacob, your name will be Israel, then that means that even though God gave him that promise, that blessing back then, that your name is changed, God never really called him by that name. Mm -hmm. wow. And then he decides uh, to call him officially at verse 10. Right here, a couple chapters later. Now, um, this is just guesswork on my part, but that's one thing that uh, I notice right here. It may be in other verses he did call him Israel, <clears throat> but the thing is, it seems as if that God is confirming his promise, what he uh, said to Jacob before. He's confirming his promise about calling him Israel, 
And the reason why he confirms his promise is because we can guess he went back to Bethel. When he went back to Bethel, refreshed his commitment, God refreshed his blessing, his promise again. This is incredibly eye-opening when you hear that. Because we know God gave us a blessing a long time ago. But a lot of times we want to be reminded. We want a confirmation of that. Now, if you don't think so, then uh, uh, you're, you're dead wrong. You and I want that all the time. Because yeah. we remember God blessed us, gave us a promise and a blessing a long time ago. But we don't want it to end there. Because years pass by, we get worn out. And uh, we want God to confirm his promise, his blessing to us. So God can only do that if you, con if you refresh and confirm your commitment as well. Amen. God's not going to confirm his blessing until you confirm your commitment to him. So this is a very good passage on that one. Everyone should have a Bethel in their life and not just a Bethel, but make an El Bethel Amen. in their lives. That's a good preaching right over there. So notice all these promises, verse 11, 12, are promises he already said to Jacob a long time ago that we know. But he's confirming his promises. Verse 11, And God said unto him, God speaks to Jacob, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So God says that he is God Almighty. He tells Jacob, that uh, spread out, increase yourself, increase the seed, your offspring. That's the idea about fruitful and multiply. He claims that a nation will come out of you, but also it says, and a company of nations shall come out of you. So this verse proves, uh, to, this verse points out just like the Abrahamic covenant, and it's confirmed, which is why people should not mess their doctrine. There's always a physical nation and a spiritual nation. There's no doubt about that. Physical Israel and spiritual Israel. So we see right here that a comp uh, it says that a nation will come out. So there's your singular physical nation of Israel. That's a no-brainer. But it says a company of nations. So then how can you get a company of nations? Well, the Bible points out that uh, anyone who receives Christ for salvation is considered to be a Jew. So any Gentile nation out there, see that? Nations, plural, become a Jew as well. Not physically, but spiritually. It is important to understand that there is no doubt there are two, there are two applications, there are two ways to look at Israel. You can't just do one. A lot of people uh, believe in replacement theology, which is heresy, Amen. that uh, there is no physical nation of Israel. No, there's a <clears throat> physical offspring. There's no doubt about that. The verses are clear. But also the verses are clear that there's a bunch of nations, a spiritual offspring that would result and come out of it. So there are two places on that. So the Gentile nations qualify to be known as a Jew. So uh, we'll just only look one verse to prove it. I've shown it many times, but uh, we'll look at one verse. Go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians. We'll look at only one verse to prove this, that a bunch of Gentile nations can also be known as a spiritual Israel. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, and then we'll look at verse 11. So the, there are Old Testament verses, Old Testament proof texts that you can point out to a Jew that uh, then what are these multiple nations that come out? How do they qualify as being Jews? If you include the New Testament church doctrine, Christian doctrine, that would make sense on a lot of the verses that God mentioned to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob Amen. about a bunch of nations coming out of him. Who else would qualify for that? So that makes a lot more sense uh, where if you include Christian doctrine and the Old Testament will become clear. But if you only have Judaism as your only true religion, the Old Testament, there's a lot of questions. The New Testament fills out the remaining pieces. Dispensationalism fills out the remaining pieces for the Old Testament. Yeah. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that being in time past, notice what? Gentiles, so they are, uh, those are non-Jewish nations, plural. 
in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. By physical ethnicity, you're a Gentile nation. But spiritually, it transforms at verse 12. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. See, you're foreigners. You're a stranger from Israel's nations and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now you're brought nigh into that. So you became a partaker of Israel's promise. Look at verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. See that? With the saints and of the household of God. You're now a fellow citizen of Israel but not physical ethnicity. If you argue, argue physical ethnicity, then verse 11, it argues physical ethnicity as Gentile don't qualify. Right. See that? Yeah. That's in the past you're called Gentiles in the flesh. No longer are we called by that. God doesn't recognize us by our physical ethnicity, but our spiritual, so to speak, a race and ethnicity, spiritual nation, the nation of Israel. This is all a spiritual operation because of the evidence of verse 18. See that? 18, all of it is operated spiritually. The access and operation is all spiritual. Okay, going back to Genesis. Going back to Genesis. And then 35, Genesis 35. Continuing onwards, uh, the last part of verse 11. And kings shall come out of thy loins. So that's pretty plain that from uh, Jacob's seed, that's the idea of his loins, which men have, that kings can come out. Multiple kings, multiple nations can come out uh, from Jacob's lineage. There's no doubt about it because the reason why is uh, Israel's nation had many kings, but as well as uh, Gentile nations who uh, would have had many people who became saved Christians, even rulers themselves. Okay, uh, verse 12. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee, uh, I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. That's very clear. God says the land he gives to Abraham and Isaac. What's the land? Why, it's Canaan at verse 6. So that's where uh, modern days would we'll call it Palestine. I do not believe in calling it Palestine because that's just trying to, sh uh, that's brainwashing people that, Palestinians own Palestine. See that? That's the idea. No, God calls it Israel. Yep. That goes to Israelites, yep. the Jews. So that was all the way uh, from Genesis, we got to realize. But then they got kicked out. They lost their home. When the Jews returned, they're only reclaiming their own land. You have to understand that. Yep. If we go back to uh, verse 12, God says the land of Canaan that he gave to Abraham and Isaac. So notice it goes from Abraham then to Isaac. It doesn't go to Ishmael. So notice that the Arabs don't qualify for that. It goes to Abraham, Isaac, and then to thee I will give it. It goes to Jacob. From Jacob you get 12 tribes of Israel. So that is clearly only Jews. And to thy seed after thee. So the seed that follows after Jacob, that land belongs to them. Will I give the land? Uh, there's no such thing as a two-state solution. No, you have to realize that land goes to the Jews. Now, uh, I know that uh, there are political problems with the nation of Israel itself. Palestinians can suffer abuse and oppression uh, from Jew uh, Israeli soldiers. But like I've taught you last time in previous verses in Genesis, the same thing can be said about the Arab nations unfairly treating the Jews. Why? Because when nations go without God, and currently the nation of Israel is without God. All right, every, every nation is doing their own thing. There will be abuses, mistreatments, war, violence. All right, that happens with all nations. That happens with all nations, whether you're Jew, Arab, or Gentile, whoever you are. Even in my own nation here, America, I'm thankful for the spiritual uh, starts, and there's no doubt God's hand was behind it, but I, I can't honestly sing God bless America anymore. America is just as pagan as Israel and any Arab nation and every other nation out there. All right, so all of them without God becomes messed up. That's why there's mistreatment, abuses. And so it is common that in Berkeley campuses, you'll see Jews and Arabs 
doing their freedom of speech protests, and then, you know, everyone's who's right, who's wrong. If you go to secular politics, everybody's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's wrong. And everybody's right. Okay? <laughs> everybody's wrong. Everybody's right. Okay? So you have to look at the Word of God. You have to go by God's terms. So God's going to clean up the mess. What you're getting right now, if you get two-state solution or an entire nation of Israel today, let me tell you, for a matter of fact, if it's without God, neither, neither way would work. Right. Israelis can argue sovereignty of their homeland. That's not going to work without God. You'll get, they're going to get the Antichrist, actually, at the end. Uh, the Arabs uh, can argue two-state solution or their own sovereignty of their land. But either way, without God, it won't work. So it's all messed up. God's term is this, the land belongs to the Jews and the Jews will get their homeland back after they get right with God and after they follow God's terms, which will happen during the tribulation. They get a whooping like no other. And if you know the history of the Jews, they've been whooped by God ever since. So it's, uh, it was horrible. So being God's, uh, well, I want to be the chosen by God. It's a lot of accountability. Okay. A lot of accountability. So the Jews, they got their reaping and sowing. So you don't have to get upset with the Jews about what the Lord promised to them. Okay, going back here, uh, verse 13. <clears throat> and God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So God, after he says all these things to Jacob, he goes up away from him at that place where he was speaking to him. So again, let me say this real quickly. Fresh review, verses 6 through 12, is God confirming his promises. He will confirm his promise and blessing if you confirm your commitment to him. And a lot of times we are fleshly people. We are weak humans. You and I would appreciate God confirming his promise here and there. Not just God saying, hey, I already died for you on the, pro on the cross. I confirmed my promise to you a long time ago, 2,000 years ago. You're okay. You don't need for me to confirm my promise to you again. Well, 2,000 years is a long time, and we're fleshly people. Sometimes we need it, not just every year, but uh, every couple of weeks or every couple of months, right? If uh, we want that from the Lord, God wants the same thing from us, from our commitment where we confirm, okay? So fair is fair. If you want God to confirm his blessing to you, you confirm your uh, dedication, your altar call to him. I don't believe in... Uh, I don't believe in a one-time altar call, to be honest, or a sermon that really hits me, then I come to the altar. Uh, back then, I, uh, the reason why I say back then is because I'm a minister now, so that's different. So I have to lead, I have to do the altar calls. But when I have an opportunity, or even before I was a minister, I went to the altar every single time. I did that. Why? Because I believe in making a fresh commitment to the Lord, fresh dedication, because I want a fresh blessing. From God. That's good, brother. Okay, let's go back. <clears throat> Verse uh, 14. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. Okay, meaning that God, Jacob, uh, at that place where God speaks to him and confirms the blessing, Jacob, he set up a, a, a pillar. Uh, uh, excuse me, I'm still asleep, yeah. <laughs> Different time zone, okay? I'm still getting used to this. So. Jacob, he sets up a pillar of stone. In this pillar of stones, he pours down a drink offering. He pours down a drink offering, and then he pours down oil as well. Now, that's pretty common in the Old Testament. When you look at the altars that they give on the sacrifices, they'll pour a drink, an offering, but it'll be a drink offering, they'll call it, as well as oil. Jacob, he's been laying down a lot of stones, you notice, right? I mean, if you look back at the previous chapters, he set up a stone here, set up an altar there, sets up a pillar of stone there. I mean, just stop, you know? Why do you do that? No, don't stop, because when you come down on the altar, you're laying down your stone here. You're laying down a pillar of stone. So it's so important that in Jacob's case, he lays down so many stones, because this is chapter 35, is probably the best chapter you'll ever see where Jacob really lives right for the Lord. This is his most spiritual chapter. Every other chapter, you'll just see him as a backslider, okay? But chapter 35 is his heyday. It's his revival. It's his blowout. He sets up altar here, altar there, stone here, stone there. 
And God in return uh, confirms, lays down blessing here, blessing there. You can, uh, uh, there's so many nuggets. <clears throat> I cannot spend so much time, but so many nuggets in chapter 32 all the way through 35. 32 to 35, if anyone can preach a whole sermon on that, that's really good. The one who was closest is uh, Pastor uh, Mike Fernandez, you might recall. That was his first sermon. That was yeah. very, very good. Very, very good. So he, he's the, probably the only preacher that I know that went through several chapters of that because his style is expository preaching. So he's really good at that one. Okay, anyway, uh, let's go back here. Let's go back. Uh, verse 15, verse 15. Okay, so it says right here, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him Bethel. So then Jacob calls the name of that place where he lays a stone that God spoke to him Bethel. So he's running out of names here, okay? Bethel, then El Bethel, then Bethel again. So why? He's confirming the old name, the old commitment. That's so good. New name, old names. New commitments, old commitments. It's confirming, confirming so many times. There's no doubt Jacob is really getting right with the Lord here. We can see that. He calls this place Bethel, even though we already know that it's Bethel. But he's confirming the name just as much as you want God to confirm it to you. So why not you confirm the name to the Lord? Confirm it. Don't just uh, say, well, I already did it a long time ago, so the Lord knows. No, confirm it. God loves that. That's why he loves prayer. Why does he love prayer? Because he already knows what's in your mind and heart, but he wants to hear you say that. He wants a confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. That's why I do not like it when people say, uh, when they condemn the sinner's prayer, saying that you can uh, believe in your heart and that's it. No, God wants confirmation. Yes. He loves to hear it from your mouth. You're openly admitting and confessing. God loves that as much as you would like that. Right. It's one thing, I mean, where you, uh, where you ladies uh, have your husband where he says, why well, I made the commitment to you long ago at the marriage, <laughs> at the wedding. I said that I, do, uh, I love you till death do, do, you, do us part. I meant that. But come on, man. I mean, you ladies want that confirmation from your husband, obviously, because you feel left out. You feel alone. You feel like he really doesn't love you. So for him to say it to you, to confirm it to you would mean a lot. Now, if that's common sense, it should be common sense, Romans 10, 9. And I don't appreciate any so-and-so out there who uses Ruckman's name, draws on a whiteboard and everything that, tr that really discourages that. I have no respect for that. All right, coming back over here. When we go to verse 16, <clears throat> and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. So they journey from Bethel. Uh, for some of you all the way in the back, I don't know if you can see that, all right? So uh, from Bethel here, where my finger's pointing, he's uh, passing toward Jerusalem. He passes where originally was Jerusalem, where he is getting close to Bethlehem now. So it says Ephrath. So notice right here, there's a parenthesis under Beth, underneath Bethlehem, Ephrath. The reason why is, remember, that's ancient times. So the old name was Ephrath. Later on, it became known as Bethlehem. So that, this is the location. Ephrath is the old name. Bethlehem is the current name. Rachel, she was in travailing. So she's giving birth to another child. She had hard labor. Verse 17, uh, And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. Okay, uh, explaining both verse 16, 17 again. When they were on their way to Bethel, there's only just a little ways left till you reach to Bethlehem or Ephrath. During that time, she was uh, about to give birth to a baby. And it just so happened, and it came to pass, while she was in hard labor, the midwife who's uh, taking care of her assures her with the statement, don't be afraid, you're going to have this baby as well. So don't worry. <clears throat> Verse 18, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. So it just so happened, that's what it means, and it came to pass, when her soul was leaving her, for she died. When she died, notice her soul is leaving her, and she calls the name of her baby Benoni. This is evidence against Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, 
do not believe that uh, when you die, the soul immediately goes to heaven and hell. They claim that there is soul sleep. But no, notice right here, the soul departs. Soul departs as soon as you die, right at death. So as soon as you die, the soul just immediately goes away. It leaves to someplace else. We, so then soul sleep is fully denied in Scripture. There's no such thing as soul sleep. Any verse that they will pull out on a person sleeping, it has to do with the body. Remember that. The body sleeps. Obviously, that's a no-brainer. We see the body down there. It's sleeping. But the soul is not sleeping. The soul departs. Any verse, remember this if, you're not, if you don't know this doctrine. Any verse a Jehovah Witness will pull to you that proves sleeping when you die, that's all body. Remember that. So don't let that fool you, okay? Let's look at uh, 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Here's another evidence. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 Kings. Now, I showed this in previous Genesis studies, but it bears repeating in case uh, we may have forgotten. So go to 1 Kings again. Then we'll look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5 and then 1 Kings. I believe it will be chapter 17. We'll look at chapter 17 and then 1 Kings 17. And then your other hand to go to 2 Corinthians 5. Okay, in 1 Kings 17, you're going to notice that the widow's son dies. When the widow's son dies, the Bible says that Elijah recognized the, that the spirit of the child left him. It wasn't sleeping. And then he asked for the spirit of the child to return back to the dead body, thus proving that you do depart after death. You do go someplace after death. You don't just fall asleep. Look at 1 Kings chapter 17. <clears throat> Look at verse 21, 21. And he stretched himself upon the child three times, the dead body of the child, and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child sold, what? Come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again. So the, the soul of the child left him. So the soul of the child had to go back into, back inside the body again. The soul wasn't sleeping there. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> and then we'll look at verse 8. Verse 8. Notice that the Bible says when you're away, uh, that when you're away from the body, you're immediately with God up in heaven. It shows that it's not sleeping. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body... When you do that, notice automatically and to be present with the Lord. Okay, going back. We return to Genesis again. So, remember, Rachel calls his name Benoni. Now, that's pretty sad. So, when Rachel dies, she calls his name Son of Sorrow. That's what Benoni means, Son of Sorrow. When Rachel calls him son of sorrow, Jacob, obviously, he doesn't want to remember his youngest son, who he loves, by, uh, by Rachel's death, right? Whenever he looks at Benj uh, Benjamin, uh, that's what Jacob called him. But for now, remember, Rachel's son, if Jacob was, a, was calling him by his name, he doesn't want to call him as the boy where his wife died. That will always be a sad memory. So uh, Rachel would call him son of sorrow, which would remind Jacob, which is kind of a mean thing to do, uh, remind him about her death all the time whenever he calls out the boy. So he changes his name to uh, Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Son of my right hand. Now, from what I see, I could be wrong, which is very sad. Rachel is a great example of how I see a backslidden fleshly woman. She's very self-centered because uh, who, would name, who would name her son that way when she dies? And especially uh, where her husband will always remember her death after, uh, when he calls the child by the name. A very self-centered woman. Self-centered, fleshly, because um, uh, beauty is vain, as the Bible said. And a lot of times women will pay attention to their beauty, make themselves look beautiful because of themselves to begin with. 
So you have to be careful of that, ladies. There's nothing wrong with making yourself beautiful. God knows, okay, I, don't, I didn't want to marry an ugly woman, okay? So God knows that too, all right? I want to marry a beautiful woman. That's just common sense. But we cannot, but the tendency, see, that's the thing. We forget our tendencies. Every action has tendencies sometimes that we have to keep a guard on. The tendency is a selfish mindset, okay? Same thing with men when they try to make themselves look pretty too. And God knows it's getting prettier, prettier every time. It's just so disgusting now, okay? And you women like it. I don't get that, okay? It's getting, it's getting worse now, okay? Some of you are shaking no. Good, stay that way, all right? Because now women just want pretty boys, okay? So it's... Uh, uh, where do, where, I got off on that. So. <laughs> every time I kick current generations, millennial generation to uh, generation X, Y, and Z, I always get off on a tangent. <laughs> Point is, is that, uh, ladies, uh, Rachel is a great study for you on uh, the woman you do not want to end up like. Her, her most spiritual time would be that time when she gave birth to Joseph. That's the only time you would see her spiritual highlight. But everything else is not mentioned. Not even Genesis 35, which is sad, where Jacob had his revival meetings. But Leah, that, that time, we see more of the spiritual side in her. It's a spiritual tendency compared to Rachel. Anyway, continuing onwards. Uh, let's see right here. V the last part of verse 18. But his father called, his, called him Benjamin. So uh, Jacob <laughs> instead changes the name to Benjamin, son of my right hand. <clears throat> That's quite a compliment he gives to Rachel, actually. Basically, he called Rachel his right hand then. And Benjamin is the son of his right hand. Continuing on at uh, verse 19. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. So Rachel, when she died, she was buried on that way to Bethlehem or on that way to Ephrath. That's why there's that arrow pointed right here where she died. It's like on the way. The Bible mentions that that place is also known as Bethlehem, Ephrath. The Bible does mention a clue uh, about Rachel's burial site even centuries later. Centuries later. We're going to look at second, uh, 1 Samuel. Notice that centuries later, her burial site was retained. 1 Samuel 10. 1 Samuel 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Notice that uh, Benjamin, his people, also retained their mother's sight, so to speak. Rachel's sight. They were the ones held in charge. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 2. The Bible says, When thou art departed from me today, Samuel speaking to Saul, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher. See that? So her burial site's retained. In the border of Benjamin, at Zelza. So... Benjamites or Benjamin and his people maintained it. So this is uh, the name of this place is Zelza. Zelza. So I'm going to put Zelza here. Now, if this is Zelza, there are some uh, people who put Zelza over here. So I don't know. It could be before Jerusalem or it could be here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two dots here. Two possibilities. That way people uh, don't get lost, okay? So Zelza could be either here or here. But the point is, it's on the way to Bethlehem. That much we do know. Okay, continuing onwards. So we keep looking at that map. All right. Go back to our main text, returning to our main text at Genesis uh, 35. Genesis 35. Genesis 35. And Israel journeyed, uh, excuse me, uh, I forgot verse 20, verse 20. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave, unto this day. So Jacob, he sets a pillar uh, at her burial site. And then when he sets up this pillar, the Bible says it's all the way to this day still there. So Moses is writing this. As Moses writes this, the Bible points out that uh, up to Moses' day, it's still there. And then when we go to 1 Samuel 10, it's still there to this day. So it's proven to be true. I don't know about today. Some people claim that they uh, have her body 
and they uh, have her burial, but uh, it's been uh, centuries after that, so we, we don't know. All right, verse 21. 21. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent uh, beyond the tower of Edar. So now when Jacob goes onward past Bethlehem, we see right here, Edar, mentioned right here. So E-D-A-R. So I don't know why I wrote E-R. Maybe because as time passed by, the name changed. But I'll put A-R. So he's at this tower of Edar. Now, he spreads his uh, tent over there, meaning he uh, pitches, he sets up, he lays out his tent and starts to live there for a while. If it's beyond the Tower of Edar, where he did his location, why would he, uh, put, why would he put his tent there? Why would he put uh, his family, his livestock there? Because usually towers during that time was a watchtower for flocks. So shepherds would go on top of the tower to watch their sheep and livestock. So it would make a lot of sense if J J uh, Jacob saw that on the way, he would put his tent over there. Notice something bad happens at verse 22. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard it. Uh, you'll notice right here at verse 22, it just so happened and it came to pass when Israel lived in that territory, that land where the Tower of Edar is located nearby, his oldest son Reuben uh, slept with his concubine, uh, Bilhah. So that's a horrible thing. And Israel, he heard it. So he knew about it, but there's no mention of it after that. His silence is very telling. It's the same thing with uh, Simeon and Levi. When they, uh, when they said, uh, when they slaughtered the people, the Bible points out that Jacob, he was silent after their comment as well. But he, was, uh, he kept it inside, that bitterness, and the silence eventually came out when we look at Genesis 40, uh, 49. So you jump to Genesis 49. We saw that Jacob, he cursed uh, Simeon and Levi, but he also cursed Reuben. He didn't uh, just curse Simeon and Levi. He cursed Reuben as well when we go to Genesis 49. It's strange that Israel never gave a comment until now at Genesis 49. The reason why, as I mentioned to you before, is I... I'm tending to lean upon is because he's reaping what he's sown. Because he's reaping what he's sown, that's the reason why he couldn't really speak out. He knew that he deserved the consequences and the bad things that happened. Um, it may be the same thing. I can't speak for parents, but um, for parents, it could be the same thing for you where you see your children messing up in their lives, but they use your life as an excuse where you're silent, or you're silent because you see a little bit of them in you when they made the mistakes, or something like that. But see, guilt eats us. Guilt's what makes us not give a comment. That's why it's so important to live right for the Lord. Otherwise, you're going to have messed up children. So in Genesis 49, verse 3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of digni dignity and the excellency of power, but unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. That's sad. You know, uh, when Jacob gives a blessing to everybody, there, is only, there are only three people that he really didn't give the blessing to. That's Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. Everybody messed up. Now, we see right here Satan trying to attack the seed again, the seed of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is supposed to come from a seed where the devil doesn't corrupt it. But you notice how the devil corrupted it every time. Genesis 3, we've seen that, what the serpent did with Eve. We've seen it again with uh, Eve's children, Cain. We've seen it again in Genesis 6, where the sons of God intermingled with the humans and God had to wipe it all out. We've seen it again at the Tower of Babel, which is why God had to separate Abraham from them, start a new seed. And we've seen it uh, time and time again where Abraham, he uh, married Hagar, so Satan tried to corrupt the seed again. And then we see it again in this case here, where Reuben messed up, Simeon and Levi messed up, and the line was corrupted. 
So that's why Judah the fourth came out at verse 8. It was Judah's line that the Jesus Christ came from that seed. So notice that Reuben could have inherited, but he messed it up. Simeon should have inherited, but he messed it up. And Levi, that's why he went to Judah. He could have went to Joseph or Benjamin, but there's a reason why he didn't. It's because the right went to the eldest right here. The right could have gone to the eldest right here, the oldest child. But uh, he messed it up right here. Remember, the birthright goes to the eldest. Esau despised his birthright. He messed it all up. The, el uh, the, elder pers the oldest person usually gets the birthright. All right, go back to Genesis 35. Genesis 35. All right, wrapping things up. Very strange how the Holy Spirit moves in verse 22. It goes, and Israel heard it, and in the same verse, now the sons of Jacob were 12, and moves on. So it, it seems as if the Holy Spirit is emphasizing how much Israel didn't make a big deal out of that, or was silent about it. He just put it behind him. And then that bitterness was building up, and then finally spilled, uh, spilled out at Genesis 49 when he cursed him. Okay, so it's talking about Jacob's sons being 12 people and then divides the names. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun. Going in order here, it's in sequence. Leah's sons. So remember, he had four wives, Jacob. So the first wife is Leah. And then the oldest son is Reuben, second, uh, Jacob's firstborn, right, it says. And then the next is Simeon. Then the next is Levi. Then the fourth, Judah. He got the blessing, remember, of Christ's seed. Then after that, Issachar, and then after that, Zebulun. Now we come to the next wife, the sons of Rachel, verse 24. Joseph and Benjamin, only two that Rachel gave birth to, uh, to boys, uh, sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Then verse 25, and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali. So Bilhah, who is Rachel's handmaid, okay, uh, Jacob's concubine, Dan and Naphtali were born from her. Next, boys, verse 26, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. So uh, Zilpah is Leah's handmaid, and she gave birth to Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padanaram. So all of these are Jacob's sons, and they were born to him at the location Padanaram, which is uh, Laban's location. You might recall as you read that chapter, all of Jacob's sons were being born at Padanaram. Laban's location, nowhere else, with the exception of one, Benjamin, verse 24, all right? Benjamin's the only exception. Apparently, that one little nitpicky thing one. is a big deal to textual critics and scholars and people, so they claim that's an error in your Bible. Come on, man, you know you're grasping at straws at that point. Yeah. It's not a big deal, all right? The reason why is, if, if you just neglected Benjamin, Let's be honest, isn't it right to say that all of them were born in Padanaram? Or, even if not all, generally, generally, when you say sons of Jacob, what location are you thinking about where they were born at? Padanaram, okay? Laban's place. Not on the way when Rachel died. That would sound strange, you know? All the sons of Jacob were born when Rachel died. That's just too weird. It would, be, uh, it would make more sense if we were to pick a location that generally the sons of Jacob were born, it would be Pat and Aram. So it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Uh, if that's an error in your Bible, man, you, you really want to be a diehard textual critic or a diehard anti-KJV person or a diehard atheist, either or. That's not a big deal. I don't see that as an error. If you want an error, you, I can find better errors in your Bible. That one's definitely not an error. I think that's just being nitpicky. It's like me giving a list of names of people in this church. Here are the list of names of uh, Bible Baptist Church, and then I will say that started in San Jose. Now, it, if you look around you, you're going to see a good percentage of you weren't there that time, all right? But there are some of you that did, uh, that were there when we had that church in San Jose. And it's accurate to say that it started in San Jose. So it's the same thing right here. Sons of Jacob that were born, which were born or started in Paddan Aram. What's the big deal about that? I mean, uh, people being nitpicky. All right, verse 27. And Jacob came. Uh, let me move this side because no one saw the notes over here. So let's wrap it up here. 
And Jake, verse 27, And uh, Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebr uh, Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. So Jacob, he finally sees his father Isaac. He comes to him, his father, at the place which is called Mamre, which is unto the city of Arba, which is also Hebron. Now, I don't have to explain that. I already gave a commentary in Genesis 13. It's common that a same location can have multiple names. That's a simple answer. So uh, when you look at this map over here, uh, Jacob, he finally comes to his destination right here. So Mamre, Hebron, etc. He arrives at this location. This is a place where Abraham and Isaac uh, sojourned. So where they temporarily resided. That was not a land that they owned. If you might recall, God promised the land to them, but they never really owned it. Because the ownership of it would be future. It's prophetic. But look at Hebrews 11. Look at Hebrews 11. The Bible interestingly actually said that when Jacob was there in Hebron and he lived there, Abraham was still alive, actually, which is very interesting. So according to Dr. Upton's commentary, it might be possible that when Jacob was 15, still living, uh, under, uh, still living with Isaac, that Abraham could have been still alive that time. So we see right here that all three could have lived here. If you look at verse 9, verse 9, Hebrews 11, 9, by faith he, Abraham, sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, <coughs> dwelling in tabernacles with, see, who did Abraham live with? Mm -hmm. Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So, it could, so Abraham could have still been alive uh, when Jacob lived there that time. It's pretty plain from Scripture. Now, in Genesis 35, uh, obviously, Abraham uh, died and passed away here at Genesis 35. But remember, like I said, when Jacob was probably 11 to 15, Abraham was still alive that time. Okay, let's look at Genesis 35 again. Genesis 35. Verse 28, And the days of Isaac were 104 score years. So Isaac's days that he was able to live was 180 years. It's possible that, Isaac, that Jacob got to see his father Isaac for 10 more years. So that's God's grace and mercy. But Rebekah's not mentioned here, as I've told you before. So she died a long time ago. The interesting part is that, remember, Isaac thought he was going to die any moment. But he still lived. He still lived. And Jacob, he possibly saw him 10 more years when he returned to the land. Uh, verse 29, and Isaac gave up the ghost and died. So that's a metaphorical phrase, meaning uh, that Isaac, when he gives up the ghost and he dies, it's a phrase meaning that his ghost uh, left him. He wasn't able to contain his spirit anymore. It left him. And then he passed away. And was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. So uh, Isaac was gathered by his people, and he was old and full of days, no doubt about that. He lived up to a good age, lived many days, many years. Gathered unto his people could mean twofold, again, like I said. One, it could be that his people is referring to his people, Jacob, Esau, and his family, relatives, and his tribe, where they were able to gather, uh, get, uh, they were able to gather his body together as they assembled. Or the more likely meaning, which Dr. Uckman argues, is that uh, Isaac, when he died, gathered to his people, he went back to his people. That's the idea. So if it means he went back to his people, that means the saints down there in the afterlife, which is Abraham's bosom that time underneath the earth. So Isaac was able to join the saints, join his people down there which is a strong argument then against Jehovah's Witnesses again. Uh, ver the last part of verse 29, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So Esau and Jacob buried uh, their father Isaac. Now remember, Jacob was the one who tricked Esau again when Jacob said, I'll follow along and I'll go to your home. And then <laughs> Jacob tricked him. They had to meet again. You wonder what would have happened at that funeral service. <laughs> That's good, Pastor. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Knowing Jacob's, uh, so I'll tell you a clue, okay? 
what I think, if I studied their personality from the previous chapter. Jacob's tendency is when he's confronted by his sin or caught, he's silent. We've seen that with Reuben. We've seen that with Simeon and Levi. The other case uh, with Esau, if uh, we kind of know, know his tendency, as time passes by, he lets it go. Okay? But I'm sure he's not happy. Okay? So Esau, he's like, this is Jake. This is, my, I mean, you ever done that with your brothers? Yeah. Like, look, this is who he is. He said that he'd do this, he doesn't. I give up, you know, whatever. Let's just bury dad and move on, okay? So it's not like he's in, I'm going to kill you again, you know. I think Jacob got the memo after his meeting I, that, you know, my older brother's behavior, he tends to let things go now. So I don't have to be fearful when we meet at the funeral service and go, oh, thy servant, and bow seven times again and send in droves of gifts. There's no record of that in the funeral. I think Jacob, after that last meeting he had with Esau, he knew that, look, Esau's the type who will let things go, okay? He's not going to murder and kill me. But I'm sure he was, he felt guilty, and his tendency is to be silent after that. Just a quiet funeral service, you know, that was it. And then Esau, he just moves along, okay? So that's the only clue that I could probably gather from that in the funeral service. Okay, we're going to cover the next chapter <clears throat> in Genesis. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers and that uh, we've grown more in knowledge of the scripture, understanding every word, understanding every word in that book so that we can understand it for ourselves, study for ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.